Well, every year at this time, I pull out some memories, and, and here's a little smile for your day. My kids were challenged in their classes at the Christian school to come up with a, a harvest costume, and uh, this is Catherine and Davey giving it their best shot. Oh dear, they're at university now, so I'll tell you how old that is. I want to encourage you to look for fun alternatives tonight for your children. Um, Compass Point Church right behind us, uh, Big Top Bash, Light Shines Bright, a fun and exciting Halloween night, 6.30 to 8.30, uh, right here behind uh, Crossroads, an evening for the kids. It's free and uh, a food item for the food bank is requested. Uh, I know that Glad Tidings has a skate night uh, for families. So t check it out. There are lots of uh, things you can do that uh, will be safer and brighter for your children on this night. 21 years ago for Kevin Philp uh, was a very different Halloween than it's going to be this year. And we've already heard why everybody calls him Kip. Welcome. Welcome back. Great to be here Pastor again. Pastor Kip. And I'm not taking you where you don't want to go because you've told me that you, your thoughts have been consumed with who you were and, and what your life was 21 years ago today. Yeah, today is an interesting day. I, I woke up really just kind of reflecting and thinking what I was doing, my mindset, how I was thinking, the, the plans that I had for that day, and, and just how in the world did I get from that to this today? And, and this is a significant day for me. And um, because 21 years ago, I had a life-changing, life-altering encounter with God. And uh, never would have guessed that I was gonna have that happen on the day that it happened in the way that it happened. Now you didn't hear a voice like Jody did, but I was so impressed that your whole growing up, your mother would say something to you every night at bedtime. It was prayers at bedtime and we didn't go to church. It wasn't a Christian home per se, but there was always this awareness of God. And mom, every night, did you say your prayers? Did you say your prayers? And my prayers never really changed. It was, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, I pray the Lord, the Lord my, my soul, soul to keep. keep. And, and it was, but it, it created this awareness because even though it was maybe just a, a bit of a rhyme that I said, I was saying that rhyme to the God that I know today. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though it became perhaps religious over time, looking back, it was so significant for me because it was planting and shaping something in my life and heart that I've seen come into fruition today. A God consciousness, how meaningful is that? And I'm just gonna fast track here. Uh, shockingly, uh, you started using drugs at 12, you were dealing drugs at 13, kicked out of school and moved into drug dealing on a bigger scale. October 31st, 1991, you were partying and you overdosed. Yeah, the plan that day was because I thought I was indestructible like so many teenagers do, was to show up and just take all kinds of drugs and give drugs out. And, uh, and I had the most terrifying experience of my life. And um, it took a bunch of drugs thinking I was going to be fine and it was just going to be like a, a typical party night. And uh, I can't really explain fully what happened to me that night. Even to this day, so many years later, I don't fully understand what happened. I just know what was taking place from my perspective. Maybe it was a near-death experience. Maybe it was some kind of psychotic episode. Maybe it was just, I, I have no idea. But from my perspective, um, there was a moment where I thought that I died. And the place that I was in changed the experience. And I understand there's hallucinations and all that, but this was so much more tangible and, it wasn't and bright. scary than, than ever. Mm. Um, and, and for whatever reason, I mean, I know the reason now, of course, but at that time, I just felt this, this thing, as a, of course, is God, drawing me to him. And... and Nobody told me I had to cry out to God. Nobody told me that that was the answer or what I was looking for. I just knew. Hmm. And, and in that moment of complete terror and fear, I just began to cry uncontrollably and ask God to forgive me and help me. And some friends eventually grabbed a hold of me. And, and again, I don't know what was happening and what wasn't. It was, it's still a blur. But they grabbed me and they pulled me outside. And I was trying to fight and escape because I didn't know what was reality and what wasn't. And, and thought that I was dead in some sort of hell type environment. And so through struggling with my friends, I lost a lot of my costume and so I didn't have a shirt on and stuff. And they grabbed me and held me down in the back of my truck and just started zipping down the road. 
And I fought free from my friends in the back of this truck and jumped head first over the side of my truck and just landed in the gravel road in my bare skin and slid down the road. And I'll never forget that moment. You know, with all the fuzz and things that are unclear, I've never forgotten this experience where I was laying in the middle of the road, covered in blood and dirt, no idea if I was dead or alive or what was going on. I remember my friends saying, forget them, let's go. And they got in my truck and they drove off and they left me in the middle of the road to die. And I felt so worthless and, and so alone. And I think it would have been so easy for me just to quit and give up if it wasn't for what I was talking about just a moment ago, mm -hmm. this drawing that I was experiencing. And I just continued that night to cry out to God. And I didn't really know how to pray other than now I lay me down to sleep. And I didn't really know how to communicate with God. So I did the only thing I could think of doing. And I sang a Christmas carol. Because <laughs> it was the only thing that had any kind of God content to it, you know, that I could think of at the moment. And so there I am on Halloween night singing a Christmas carol. And years later, I'm thinking, why a Christmas carol? It was a way in a manger, no crib for a bed. It's and a Jesus focus. It certainly <laughs> was. And, and you know, I thought about it later, just about how in that dark, dark moment that the world was facing, that God sent his son to be a light and life and sent his grace right in the, the darkest moment of planet Earth. And, and in a very real sense, I was there in my darkest moment. And on a day when people put on masks, my mask was off and I was completely vulnerable before God. And God stepped down into my darkest moment and brought light and life. And now you're doing that for, for so many people in, in a, an unusual place. I mean, I don't know of another church in a nightclub, uh, actually an historic nightclub in Burlington. Yeah, it was the longest running nightclub in Canada. And uh, a few years ago, we uh, came up with the idea of, of planting a church, or had the vision, I guess, of planting a church in a non-traditional environment and um, started looking around at different places. Never thought it was gonna be a nightclub. That was not on the list. And I just kept coming across this, kept seeing it in the newspaper, hearing all kinds of negative press, overcrowding issues. And so I, uh, I just got this idea that I just need to go knock on the door one day. So I went and I knocked on the door and um, uh, the manager, you know, answered and I asked him, do you ever rent this place out? That's a unique baptismal there, Kip. Just yeah, <laughs> portable hot tub. And uh, we only use it for baptisms, I promise. So you were looking just to rent it initially? Just, just to rent it out. Uh, just they once were a week. still operating? It was still a fully functional nightclub. And so they would operate on Fridays and Saturdays, and then we would come in on Sundays and set up and have a church service. And, and of course, the goal was to you know, have church in an environment where maybe people who weren't comfortable in a traditional church environment would feel comfortable coming in. We still worship with all of our heart. We still preach the Word of God. We still, you know, you know do things um, with the same intensity I would in any other environment. But it was just about changing some of these subtle things to help it be more inviting, perhaps, you know, for people who were searching and didn't feel comfortable taking that step through more of a traditional setting. You started the year with 19 baptisms, you were telling me? Yeah, on our anniversary, we baptized 19 people, mostly new believers. And then just a couple months ago, we baptized another eight. How do you draw people to an unusual setting like this? Is it word of mouth primarily? It's primarily word of mouth, absolutely. People bring their friends. I think there's a curiosity factor, and I, and I love that because if you think about the story of Moses, you know, in the burning bush, it was curiosity that led him into the presence of God. It was, here is a bush, and it's not burning up. And, and because he was curious, he went into it and found himself on holy ground. And I know that it's a former nightclub, but, but God is doing such a tangible, powerful work there. And it's amazing how curiosity has led people into the presence of God. And we've seen lives changed as a result. I wonder with the reality of people, a lot of people moving away from a traditional church experience, if this is actually appealing to those who want God in their lives, but think they don't want what they think church is. <laughs> Does that sound odd? No, not at all. I, I mean, we're finding the demographic is getting more and more mixed. 
And in our first couple years, it was a room full of 25 year olds. Mm. And um, it, it scared me a little bit because, you know, I've got a 19 year old now, a 16 year old, and we've got a 10 year old. And, um, you know, and I just knew health wise that we needed to have a lot more diversity. And so we really began to pray into that. And we're seeing more and more, not just people who are new to church coming in, but people who are maybe are, are the de-churched, um, people who um, have been There's part of the church. There's a new word for me, the de-churched. De-churched, I'm not sure it's a real word, but... Uh, I get it. <laughs> let's keep using it and it'll end up in the dictionary one day. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> and, uh, but we're, we're also seeing there's a lot of mature Christians that are coming and... and, and you need those people. We absolutely You need the mentors, do. don't you? We do. With a young crowd. And, and so one of the greatest joys, we just turned five years old as a church uh, in February. Congratulations. And one of the greatest joys is just seeing the maturity. You know, it's almost like after five years, everyone just went, ah, and there's this stability that's come in, and we've got people that have come alongside, and we've got some gray heads in there as well, which, you know, uh, and we've got some wonderful people that say, you know what, the music's a bit loud, and it's not necessarily my style, but we believe in what God is doing here, and we're going to invest in the next generation. Tremendous. Well, Kip, one of uh, the folks who regularly emails me, his inspirations, Phil Kurtz uh, sent this. I want to show you this graphic. Uh, this is, um, you'll, you'll appreciate this, Perma Shine. Those of us from the drug culture thought the only way to be happy was to be stoned all the time. But I've found a new joy in Jesus. With him, it's not just a temporary glaze, it's a permanent shine. Amen. Perma Shine, you're a wonderful example of that. And I hope that some of those who are coming into the 24-7 church are making that discovery. I'm sure that's the case. Thanks so much.